Tag to our Guten Tag to all of our friends in Austria. Thank you for attending this webinar series. Um, please don't forget that the second one is next Friday at the same time. And then thank you to Gamma Dental for providing this valuable information on the Cadillacs. It's been much needed. Whitmix Corporation is the only North American distributor, and it, we have been educating schools, military institutions, and clinical providers with this education on the features, benefits, and the utilization of the Cadillacs for a number of years. Every time I host a program, I always get questions about how to apply this data and to their cases and whether or not this is in the uh, design digital design software. So with that in mind, um, all the changes to the digital workflows, it's now um, available and good news. We can use all the uh, CADIX recording data in the digital design software. And Christian Slavacek, electrical engineer, and Thomas Havero, software engineer, they're going to they're continuing to develop the Gamma Dental software and its integration into the workflow. Thank you so much, and we've got a lot to cover, so let's jump in, Christian. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Christian Slavicek, and I uh, would like first of all thank Whitmix Company to invite me for holding this webinar. Uh, as it is said, it's two parts. The first part today will cover uh, several uh, topics, uh, mostly on the recording side. So I want to talk about the principles of axiopantographic recording, significance of hinge axis, uh, jaw tracking classification, and discussion of advantages, disadvantages of available jaw tracking systems. And then also about that, what we call the intended purpose of the instrument, uh, some technical principles, uh, recording procedures, short description of uh, recording also with true hinge axis, then uh, talk about cardiac results, uh, the setting for the articulator, and finally also today a preview of the next webinar where we do the transfer of cardiac data into the ExoCAD software. First of all, I would like to introduce uh, ourselves. We are uh, Gamma Dental and Visit uh, is based next to Vienna in Austria in a town called Klosterneuburg and some pictures. Klosterneuburg is famous for good white wine and for uh, the monastery actually. It's uh, situated next to the Danube River and here you see the old church uh, of Klosterneuburg and the uh, monastery with the old emperor head uh, from a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, visit uh, it means Vienna School of Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Dentistry. It's a non-for-profit uh, organization which was founded by my father, Professor Rudolf Slavicek, who passed away last year. And uh, actually, I would like to dedicate this lecture uh, to him. So what is VISIT, our philosophy, our common understanding? It is the respect of the individuality of the patient so that we need to have a detailed diagnostic workup before any dental intervention. We have a, to, a need for a holistic view to the patient and the dental work. So a holistic view means a cybernetic thinking of the organ, interdisciplinary, and multidisciplinary approach in dentistry is very necessary. Occlusion and function of the organ to be considered of high importance. An organ actually is defined by the functions. And consequently, we understand dentistry as a medical profession. So some information about our history. Uh, VISIT was founded in 2008. Uh, and uh, has a main focus on individualized functional dentistry in occlusion medicine on the basis of the Vienna School of Interdisciplinary Dentistry, according to Professor Rudolf Slavicek. At the beginning, we were assigned by the Austrian Dental Association, being responsible for parts of their continuous education program here in Austria. So uh, very soon, so 2013, we started cooperating with the Medical University of Vienna in terms of organizing a master science program in prosthetic dentistry. And 2016, all our educational efforts were shifted to the 
Dental University Clinic of Dentistry in Vienna, and all the courses are certified in, cooper in cooperation with the Medical University in Vienna. And since 2021, we also have a new branch, a new uh, issue, which is really important for us. It's the area of research. And the goal is to create in-depth knowledge of occlusion and function for the benefit of clinicians and the benefit of the patients. So as I said, since 2016, we are uh, based with uh, our education at the Medical University in Vienna, but also we see here uh, the world map with uh, the heart, so the center in Vienna. Others will see differently, of course, but we are also educating all around the world. And through our programs, uh, we have annually something like 600 students in our curricula. And just recently, we opened uh, another affiliation in, in South America, in Peru. Uh, every year, uh, our international faculty is meeting in July in Vienna. Uh, and this is really important. And you see a lot of nice people there. And there is also our flagship event, the Visit Summer School, which will be the next one in July 24 to 28. It's a great chance to learn more about Visit, uh, to discuss and talk about occlusion. We have a lot of great lectures. So it's uh, a good chance for you to get more uh, information about uh, our systematics. So here you have a QR code if you're interested in any of our educational uh, or research programs. So please go ahead and make a photo. Just wait a little bit. Okay, so uh, now uh, about uh, the visit systematics. I think uh, this is a key uh, graph of ours, which shows the cybernetic schema of the stomatognathic system. You see that the definition of the masticatory organ for us has the functions in the center. So you see mastication, speech, and so on. And so all, all of those dynamic function of the masticatory organ and the functions are supported by the structures, by the temporomandibular joints, by the neuromuscular system, and by occlusion, and also supported by the central nervous system with the soma, the central nervous system itself, and the psyche. So this defines the organ, which is embedded in the organism, as you can see here, but also important, it's embedded in the environment. So if you have this in mind, it is clear that we need a comprehensive uh, diagnostic workup before any dental intervention. And we call the visit systematics individualized functional dentistry in occlusion medicine. So we have anamnestic protocols, we have a clinical examination like muscle palpation, we have a clinical instrumental analysis, actually, which is the main topic of my lecture today. Then we have instrumental analysis, which is going to be the main topic of the next week lecture. And then we have imaging procedures and diagnostics, interdisciplinary teamwork, multidisciplinary teamwork, and interdisciplinary cooperation in phase one and phase two occlusal rehabilitations. Now let's, after this introduction, let's jump into the topic one and two, which is axiopantographic principle and the significance of hinge axis. So if we see here the mandibular axis of rotation, so you see the three graphs. We have a sagittal axis of rotation, a frontal axis of rotation, and we have a horizontal, which actually is called the hinge axis. So there is a, a principle in, in physics, meaning when two uh, three-dimensional bodies are connected by two joints, by definition, so that the joints are working, there must be one combined axis. And in this human setup, it is the hinge axis. So geometrically, hinge axis is part of the mandible. It is inherent that the mandible and hinge axis move together during function, functional movements of the jaw joints. From a kinematic point of view, the hinge axis and the mandible are a unit. In this, uh, graph on the left side, you see a schematic uh, drawing of the temporomandibular joint. So you see the glenoid fossa, you see the uh, disc, and you see the condyle head. And actually, we have what we call a, 
an upper joint space between disc and fossa and a lower joint space between a condyle head and fossa. And in this quite very famous video of Vesterson and Ericsson, you, you see the temporomandibular joint in function. So you see that the disc during translation is moving together with the condyle. And in the lower joint space, you see that there is a mainly the rotational component of the movement. So, uh, and it was already British anatomist Henry Gray described in 1897 that the temporomandibular articulation consists of two distinct joints, one between condyle and interarticular fibrocartilage and the other between the fibrocartilage and the glenoid fossa. So this is a dual joint we are talking about and under normal ligamentary conditions in the intra internal capsular structures, rotation mainly occurs in the lower joint space and translation maybe mainly in the upper joint space. So if we look to the left side, this is the Postle's envelope of motion uh, he published in 1952. You can see that uh, with chin guidance and uh, some uh, withholding pressure between points A and B, we can see a pure rotation in the temporomandibular joint. So this means movement only in the lower joint space. And we can locate the hinge axis, which we then, and you can see it on the right graph, where we can see then the, the tracing of the hinge axis of the translational uh, part of the hinge axis of the mandible movement. And uh, you know that the mandible, cons mandible movement consists of rotation and translation. And on the left graph, again, you see that we have undisturbed uh, uh, tracing uh, when we are tracing on hinge axis. And then on the right graph, you see, and we are not on uh, hinge axis and trace the movement of the mandible, then we have geometrical artifacts, which we don't like. So, and this is a graph, uh, which is also very important. You can see in the, in the center, a cardiac recording, which shows a protrusion and an open close overlaid. Uh, so there is just the translational component. This in the center is on hinge axis recorded and exactly the same movement is trans, uh, translated by 10 millimeters in a circle. Okay, so you see there are eight other positions. And you can see that even if it's exactly the same movement of the mandible, we are getting totally different results. Okay, So this means hinge axis is a prerequisite for accurate axiopantographic recording. And what do we need? We need basically a two face bows. We need a system which is mounted to the cranium, which is the cranial face bow. And we have a mandibular face bow, which is mounted to the mandible. And between the upper cranial and lower mandible face bow, we have a recording system. Here you see a very simple one. So it's a mechanic flag with paper. And then we have a needle pointing on the paper, which is more or less the extension of the hinge axis. And we can locate the hinge axis, but we also can draw the translational movement here on this paper flag. And here you see a video, I hope you can see it well, where uh, uh, a doctor is locating the hinge axis on the patient. So he's guiding the patient to a posterior position with this system. He's going to actually to point B in the postal scheme, holding the mandible back, then closing it to the point A and marking the second point. And in theory, when he would be already with the needle on hinge axis, there would be no, there would be the same point. Okay, now we, we see that there are two points. So the operator knows that he's not on hinge axis. He, he will adjust the needle to a new position and repeats the same procedure. First moves the mandible forward, backward to a posterior position, opens. Okay, so that he's coming back to the point B, then marks the first time, and then closes to point A and marks again. And you should see already here that the points are a lot closer to each other, but still we have a difference of point A and point B. So he needs again to adjust and 
moves forward and backward and repeats the procedure. So this is the what we call the iterative uh, method of hinge axis location, which are also in literature is described as the gold standard for finding the mandibular hinge axis. So now he's doing the two point again, and you see we are already very close. I don't continue here because you can imagine that uh, he needs another small adjustment, but this is the way how it works to locate the hinge axis. So the significance of hinge axis uh, and exact mounting is that we have uh, we need a unified coordinate system, else we would have more or less handheld models. So this coordinate system is uh, established by the reference position or centric relation record, and uh, this uh, brings uh, the face bow with the anterior uh, third point of reference. We call it axis orbital plane, and uh, it is a possibility then to mount to the articulator and is a prerequisite for instrumental analysis in the articulator. On the other side, uh, significance is also that we, with the hinge axis, we have interference-free closure. So uh, this means that whenever we have vertical changes in occlusion and you are not on hinge axis, you may, may have uh, geometrical effects, as I have shown before. And this was also published by Bosman in the 1970s, where he showed the effects. And with even with an arbitrary phase bow, you might have negative effects. And uh, the problem is that you don't know. And, and it's a uh, simple risk management, in my opinion, to locate the hinge exit. And on the other side, uh, it's a protection of the condyle disc fossa relation. So for an example, if you do a, a, a splint okay, and ask the patient to, to wear the splint and you are dislocated from hinge axis, this might uh, influence the condyle disc fossa relation. Finally, and of course, uh, we want to have during the recording no curve distortions. So we don't want wrong readings and wrong interpretation, as you can see here on the right side of the graph. Okay, here on the right side of the patient, which is left side on the graph, we see on recording on hinge axis, and this is off hinge axis. So as I proposed before, hinge axis is a prerequisite of accurate axiopantographic recording. And be aware, this is a picture from Bosman from 1974. He shows the different type of uh, methods to locate the hinge axis. Okay, we don't need the left, most left one, but in, with the kinematic method, uh, clinical investigation, so true hinge axis location, we can locate the hinge axis in a range of 1.7 uh, square and millimeter square. And here with arbitrary phase or anatomic phase or it's a better name in my opinion, it would be 11 times 18 in millimeters and with palpation method 15, 19. But there are other methods where you don't use a phase but just place it in the middle and then you may have may have uh, bigger differences from true hinge axis. Okay, now next topic would be uh, jaw tracking classification and some discussion about advantages, uh, disadvantages of uh, jaw tracking systems. There is a uh, uh, important document, uh, which is the S2K guidelines. It was published uh, by the German Society of Cranial Mandibular Function and Disorders. And the first version was published in 2017. And this version has been published just last year. And what it gives us uh, as a manufacturer, it gives us guidelines uh, about how accurate uh, recordings uh, should be and, and what uh, 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 parameters a, a jaw tracking uh, system should be in within. Okay, And basically, the guidelines say that uh, hinge axis location should be done better than close to two millimeter. Angular measurements should be not worse than of three degrees and linearity of an axis should be better than 5%. Uh, the other thing which is really important and also educationally nice or, or, or to understand is that they have a classification which I extended a little bit, but basically it's uh, on the base of these guidelines. So they have different type of jaw tracking systems. The first group A classification type would be the classic uh, axiograph, pantograph, 
also the cardiacs. These are extra oral recording system near the joint and it's touching. So we have a stylus on the flag or a paper with a needle on uh, in this direction. And then we have the classification to type B, which be also extra oral near the joint. So the recording is on the joint, but there is no contact. This is one system from Germany. It's called Blue Fox. Then we have the classification type C, which is extra oral non-contact measurement system close to occlusal plane. This means that the sensors are uh, the cameras here, as an ex example with the Sabre system, the cameras are from coming from up down. OK, and the sensors, uh, the measurement sensors are more or less in an extension of occlusal plane. And uh, here we have classification type B, where we have extra oral close to the incisal and uh, without contact means that the cameras are in the front and the sensors are perpendicular mounted to occlusal plane. Here up is a, a, a Mocho system and this is a Italian uh, Icarus system. And they also define then intraoral uh, uh, systems uh, which are on the market. Uh, but I think this is not so important now to discuss that in this webinar. Okay, I would like to uh, talk uh, about a, a publication or two publications from Albert Mail. He is from the University of Zurich uh, and he was discussing on a mathematical principle about the determination of the terminal hinge axis. And uh, he was, uh, of course, uh, uh, mentioning that the iterative method near joint measurement uh, setup is is the gold standard to locate the hinge axis and it's really well described in a lot of literature from McCollum, Lovitzen, uh, Bosman and also my father uh, that this method is more or less uh, standardized and the gold standard okay and actually it's it applies to the classification type A and B and it can be used in a different type of recording system uh, relate within this uh, group and he's uh, uh, criticizing uh, anterior measurement uh, sensor setups because he's saying that measurement inaccuracies uh, in the classification type C and D may lead to, uh, even if we just have 50 microns of measurement inaccuracy, this creates uh, great uh, errors in hinge axis location. He developed his own method, which he called least square method. However, markers need to be positioned with an angle of at least 45 degrees, as he shows in the graph here. And uh, this is the only way to come to uh, a, a, a good accuracy as the uh, mechanic axial pantograph localization method, so better than a millimeter. And uh, with the actual state of national equipment, he says, says that the highest accuracy can only be achieved with TMJ near measurement system. And this is now a statement from me, it means that if you have this intersection angle as a goal of 45 degrees, use, using anterior markers requires then infeasible large measurement volumes. And in a second publication, which was then in 2020, he also criticizes any uh, electronic uh, hinge axis location because uh, he find he, he simply proves on a mathematical principle that if you cannot uh, separate translation from rotation rotation during the uh, uh, localization process of hinge axis, you always end up with uh, a lot too deep uh, in the ramus uh, located hinge axis electronically. And uh, this is something why we believe that it's always uh, necessary to have the, the choice uh, with the classic iterative method uh, to locate hinge axis. And also with our big machine, with the Cardiax 4, we have the electronic version, but also all our students really need to learn first to do because it's uh, with the computer, it's always difficult. You have many influences. You have the screen, you have the patient, you maybe not advanced, you have the foot pedal, uh, you have uh, procedures which you have to follow. So I think uh, the classic method to locate the hinge axis, my father always said it's a privilege. Uh, it's a part already of your diagnostic finding. And if you do it uh, left, right side, it 
doesn't take you more than two or three minutes. So, and this is an example when you are uh, off hinge axis in a, in a vertical. So you can see that this is a 10 millimeter scale. If you are 10 millimeters up or 10 millimeters down, your readings already change by approximately eight degrees. So it's a big impact to record on hinge axis. And there is no reason why not locate hinge axis in the classic. And on the market, there are other methods to locate the hinge axis. Some uh, schools or some, also some companies propose that you can do protrusion and open, opening translational movements. And when the curves overlap, then it should be the hinge axis position. Then you could do two stepping movements, unguided, recorded to find hinge axis uh, or repetitive opening closing movements with the tongue positioned on the palate or repetitive open closing movement while the patient smiles or static or dynamic recording with intro scanner or others i don't know however be aware no support in the uh, scientific literature for any of these methods so it should be first proven and then uh, it should then we can use it in our daily practice for our patients and uh, in regards to virtual hinge axis uh, I would like to show you some recent studies. This is a pub uh, publication from 2023, actually from this year, where they compared the Sebris uh, jaw motion recording with 10 patients against the cardiacs. And uh, they did the same patients, uh, I think five times uh, with the Sebris and five times with the cardiacs. And actually, they found out that with a statistical linear mixed model that the there is no significant uh, statistical difference between the two recordings. However, uh, we think that the linear mixed analysis model is not the right one because they should have used the interclass correlation coefficient. And uh, good enough, this uh, study also uh, 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 published the raw data. And we look to the raw data of the recordings of the Sebris system, for example, here on the left side and compare it to the cardiacs. Okay, so we can look uh, to three or five millimeter records, but the values are totally different. So 50% of all the values don't fit at all. So we are working 60 degrees against 46, 39 to 57 and so on and so on. So. I think that the conclusion uh, based, which says that uh, the recordings of the Sebrick optical sim demonstrate comparable accuracy to gamma cardio cardiacs doesn't fit to the data and is on only to be explained by using the wrong statistics. And I also was looking for the, uh, when preparing for the lecture, I was looking for the accuracy of the Mocho system because it's very popular at this time. And I don't find too much of literature, but there is one work from Campbell from the University of Houston, and I compare it to a study which was done at the Tufts University uh, with Bill Mizzet and uh, with the cardiac system. And uh, the uh, Campbell uh, found out that uh, the Mocho is measuring within plus uh, minus five degrees. So if I use now the uh, distribution of condylar inclination, sexual condylar inclination, uh, this is a study from Corps uh, from Germany on a population. Uh, and uh, here are 300 temporal mandibular joints. You more or less see that the distribution is between 35 and 55. But if I if I now overlay the accuracy in an in vitro study, I can see that plus minus five is just a big range. And for me, the question is, wouldn't it be easier just to set the articulator to 45 degrees? If we compare to the cardiacs, it was found in Tufts that we have no value which was greater often than two degrees. So and if we apply the same, you can see a remarkable uh, difference and there is another study done from uh, more about Mocho, uh, which is from uh, 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 Barbell actually from the University of Nice, and they were looking for the results for the repeatability of the recordings with the Mocho, and they found that uh, the 
uh, repeatability was fair and was good and, and uh, so they they concluded uh, that uh, uh, the reliability that the Mojo device records reliable uh, the patient's real hinge axis kinematics but I think uh, if we look to something uh, so this important graph in measurement okay we need to know that the repeat repeatability is the precision okay so how how close how close are my measurements okay and it's not really the fact that we need the other fact would be that we need to know the trueness of the of the recording system okay so this is only half of the story so i think that the uh, statement which comes as a conclusion is just not correct because it was not uh, it, it doesn't confirm with the results and it doesn't confirm with the study at all okay and my conclusion with the virtual hinge axis is that the, in, the intended purpose of a jaw tracking uh, instrument must be clearly defined by the manufacturer and device should be exclusively used accordingly to such a statement. Uh, the hinge axis localization is most critical for accuracy of jaw tracking results. A clear distinction in publication should be made between different classes of jaw tracking system because the layout in our opinion, the layout of the measurement sensors influence the quality of the acquired data. And I, I really aim uh, scientific studies to use the terminology correctly. True hinge axis, AB classification type and versus virtual hinge axis uh, classification type C and D, as we can see here again in this classification graph. Okay, now uh, let's go to the next topic is topic five and six. So we, I talk, want to talk about technical principles of the cardiac short tracking system and also about the cardiac's intended purpose of use. So this is now a little bit the technical section of my lecture. So in general, uh, we are just all these figures, but uh, our tests of our cardiac system are going that we are uh, releasing systems when they are measuring within a range of plus or minus 1.5 degrees. And we have two systems, the Compact and the Cardiax 4, and the Compact flags are smaller. They have a, 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 a dimension of 40 times 40 millimeters, and the Cardiax uh, 4 have 60 by 60, because in the Compact system, we only are measuring translation with one stylus, and in the Cardiax 4, we have a double stylus system, which obviously takes more space. The cardiac system can record jaw movements according to anatomic or true hinge axis. Okay, also the cardiac compact system can. So we have on the left the, the standard uh, setup with anatomic face bow uh, system with the compact recording, and we are recording here only translation. Here we see a kinematic face bow. Also, the lower is a kinematic phase bow, so with micro-adjustable mechanics. And it can uh, record here, because we have one stylus, also from hinge axis, uh, just the translation. And here you see the Cardiac 4 system condylograph that has a double stylus system for full uh, recording of translation and recording uh, of rotation. So in the cardiac, some cardiac regulatory classifications in Europe, it's a class 1M, so it's low risk with measurement function. So our CE certificate uh, certification has a, because it's a measurement device, it has a notified body. Notified body means that the, the government is controlling our measurement function by the regulatory audits. Okay, in United States, the cardiac is a class one jaw tracking device for monitoring. Okay, so which gives uh, here the definition. Uh, there is another class which is a class two. It was before diagnostics, but I don't think that there is even one system that gives a meaningful output directly uh, a diagnosis with the jaw tracking system. So it's in United States is class one. So and uh, this is also important. It's our statement statement of the manufacturer is that the cardiac system is designed for the restoration and display of hinge axis movement of the human mandible conversion of these movements to the intercondylar distance of the articulator and calculating set setting for the articulator regardless if analog or digital 
appropriate to the patient, to the individual patient. The system is used by dentists and dental technicians. So this intended use is very important always for you also to read with uh, any kind of medical device, but I'm sure you know about, okay? So uh, topic seven and eight is now the recording process with the compact, but also show a little bit uh, something with uh, true hinge axis with the Cardiax 4. As a mounting, uh, we are standardized using a tray clutch, uh, which goes uh, onto the lower arch. We have here bite registration material, which is filled into the tray, uh, for example, GC Exabyte 2. And uh, then it's fixed to the, to the lower teeth. On the other hand, al alternatively, we have the so-called individual functional occlusal clutch, which is first adapted to the lower arch okay as you can see here so it's it's bent so that it fits to the lower arch you can could do that also theoretically in the patient mouse and then uh, with temporization material for an example protein 4 we are making an individual impression of the buccal surfaces of the lower arch and this is equilibrated so that you can see here the buccal surfaces and then we glue it to the uh, to the lower arch. The advantage of this system is, of course, that uh, patients still can bite and use the occlusion. But the other advantage is also, or the disadvantage with the tray clutch is that, uh, especially with deep bite cases, you might have a lot of initial opening and you might have already impact to your uh, anatomic or true hinge axis position because the patient is already in translation by the tray clutch system. So now the mounting the, the anatomic face bow, you know anatomic face bow, this is uh, the cardiac face bow, is a Frankfurt horizontal face bow, it has a support in the on the nose and in the ear and it's uh, fixed with an elastic strap band, okay, actually the, the the ear supports are resting against the posterior border, so we don't want to compromise the anterior border where we have the temporomandibular joint. Then we have the lower face bow as a standard configuration. It's non-adjustable, but we have these axis locator pins. Uh, with these pins, uh, uh, when putting it on the anterior rod, we can go and, and adjust the lower face bow's side arms to the anatomic hinge axis. As you can see here, the mounting procedure, and this is maybe important for you. So when you are uh, fix, uh, fixating the face bow, you first have to you first have to guide the patient posteriorly, then close the outer screws, which are here one, and finally close uh, the screw on the uh, on the anterior rod of the clutch. Here you see the face bow setup, upper lower face bow. We still have the axis pin pins in, then you remove the axis pins. When you take them out, they should go out without uh, any friction and uh, be careful that the face bow is not jumping. So if this something like this would happen, then you have made a mistake during mounting and you should remount the lower face bow and do the procedure again. And if you keep the mandible posteriorly, you can see from the side that, uh, the lay that, that uh, we have the ear channel here the position and then we have the anatomic uh, hinge axis which is anterior to the ear channel and the lower face bow when mandible is in a recruited position exactly points to this anatomic hinge axis position. So here you have the layout and we can mount now the cardiac flex on the face bow, the cardiac stylus on the face bow and we'll be ready for the recording. Okay, now alternatively, let's look to the true hinge axis. So we use, we call it condylograph. Okay, so this is uh, an alternative face bow and uh, it goes, has also a support on the nose and, but it doesn't go into the ear here. You can see, so it lies on the, on, on top of the ear and it's fixated with the elastic strap bands, one up and one to the back head, as you can see here. Clutch system is the same, so I don't need to show that again. And uh, we have uh, uh, this uh, adapter pins, which uh, we need to mount the flags. And uh, we also, also we work here from, we want to work with kinematic hinge axis. 
we still want to pre-adjust the lower phase flow to the anatomic axis because it simply makes sense to locate the hinge axis from there, the true hinge axis from there. Therefore, we have the adjustment through the ear channels, but they are only temporary used to adjust here up and forward position of the face bow. And finally, we so, sorry, finally we remove this ear uh, locators again so that here is no uh, uh, interference in the ear with uh, this uh, metal pieces. So then we have an adjustable lower face bow. The difference here is that we have a micro adjustable mechanics. But as I said before, we we're going to locate the anatomic hinge axis first. As you can see here, again, uh, we are parallelizing the face bow and uh, going posteriorly and tightening the screw in this pro pro posterior position. As you can see here, the face bow mounted still with the axis locator pins. Then we remove the axis locator pins again. We don't want friction. It should go out like uh, very easy. Uh, you can see here the same as before. We have the ear channel here and anterior the anatomic position. So now we locate two hinge axes. What we can do and what is the beauty, I think, of the system. Mechanic flag, paper, mounted, needle, and let's go. Okay, hinge axis location as I have shown before. I think this is a very, very unique thing. And this should be done. The mechanics, uh, the micro adjustable mechanics of the lower face bow allow you with these two screws to move the face bow, the back of the face bow in the anterior posterior region and also with screw B to go up and down here. So with this system, we can locate through hinge axis. Also with the face bow, we can use an anterior reference point to the Frankfurt plane, which would be just, a which would be a 22 millimeters offset from the, the from the nasium point or we have an individual facebook which also would allow you to mount to any uh, plane of reference and record to any plane of reference which you want to choose so here you see the completed setup of the facebook okay. next we are connecting the cardiac unit with the usb port of the computer we have a foot pedal that uh, will help us to start uh, the recordings and we connect the flags and stylus system, the sensor system to the cardiac uh, unit and then we are ready for the recording. So we start the, you have to start the cardiac uh, recording software which is on your Windows, Windows PC and basically the software allows you to record uh, all the border movements, so protrusions, mediatrusions, right, left, open, close, and also CPM as an option. And you can record uh, three of each of these uh, uh, border movements. So the first thing you have to do is to define the face bow, which you have to do only once when you install, when you work always with the same, same face bow, you don't have to do that again. In this case, we are taking the gamma reference uh, face bow. And we are starting the recording by just switching here on. And then we have to enter the flag distance, which we can read on the face bow. You know that every face has a different width. So this scale value is important to be entered here in the software. So very simple. And of course, a little less simpler with the uh, condylograph face bow, where we are individual with the individual plane. So we have to enter six of the values, okay? But it's not undoable, I would say like this, okay? Then next step is we are taking reference position. Reference position is a retual unst unstrained border position as we define also our, let's call it sent regulation. It was published in 1993 by Pieslinger and my father. And this is uh, our way uh, to, to control with gene control to keep the mandible in the posterior position. And then we do the recording. First, the patient is moving forward, backward. So we are recording protrusion, retrusion movement. The protrusion, retrusion movement, uh, as you can see here, the mandible moves forward, backward. And the resulting graph looks like this. And I'm gonna explain now uh, what it is. It's important that the curves are already calculated 
to an intercondylar distance of 110 millimeters, which is a standard for most articulators on the market. And you can see the coordinate system here related. So if this is the hinge axis mounting position, we see the X axis going plus to the forward, to the anterior, Z axis goes plus downwards, and the Y axis is to the right to the right side it's the plus so if we are looking to this coordinate system now and we see this graph we can see on the right side the of the patient right side of the of the patient the sagittal tracing will be placed is this projection plane the transversal would be here and the same on the other side on the left side we're going to have the tracing here sagittally and uh, the component, the transversal component on this graph. So the next is that we are recording the media intrusion movement to the right. This means that the right condyle is the media intrusive condyle. Okay, this means that the chin is moving to the left shoulder. I know this is confusing, however, and it sometimes it makes uh, problems with the a final recording because you are not getting values if you mix it. So don't tell the patient to make a meditation right because he for sure will move the chin to the right side. So it should be exactly opposite. So the meditative condyle is the right condyle. Okay, so we see this unilateral movement here to the to the left, the chin to the left. Okay, and the resulting graph looks approximately like this in this individual case. Then we are taking the recording to the other side and we're gonna have that drawing like here okay and we see the uh, movement uh, on the left side the media intrusive condyle is orbiting here on this side and finally we are taking an open close tracing as you can see here and we see the maximum open and closing and we are recording it okay uh, we also have the option here you see all three recordings done with this case, with this patient. Okay, so three open close, three media left, three media right, and three protrusion. Just a word for the CPM. CPM is a, it means condyle position measure. It would allow you when you use the individual functional clutch to measure positions. Okay, so you could measure the difference in the joint level when the patient is in reference position versus maximum intercospation. So you can see how occlusion influences the temporomandibular joint position of the hinge axis. So now coming to the next, which would be the mounting. It is really important to, to see and understand this picture when you are uh, recording to a reference plane in this graph, in this schema, you see the Frankfurt horizontal face bow and you can imagine that we are getting angulations here to the frankfurt horizontal plane we also need to mount the models to the same plane so that the values we obtain from the cardiacs will then fit exactly to the articulator so you cannot use uh, let's say uh, a cardiac face bow uh, 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 anatomic face bow with frankfurt and then mount with another method uh, to come plane or to whatever okay and and uh, mix the data because they don't simply fit together so you need to be aware that you need to be consistent between recording and mounting so here just some slides with the, our, uh, the anatomic facebook we just uh, uh, use a bite fork uh, the same Facebook like recording and we directly or indirectly mount to the articulator. There's no magic. And there is also the analog method with true hinge axis. We need to have this mounting stand here. As you can see here, this we cannot directly mount, but we have the hinge axis points left and right side here and the anterior third point of reference defining the axis orbital plane. Here you can see the plane and with this, we can mount to the articulator. And uh, finally, also, I would like to have a small preview of the next uh, week uh, seminar, the virtual articulation with exact hinge axis so, so, or anatomic hinge axis. So the goal is direct digital workflow with exact or anatomic hinge axis. 
so we need to have some extra uh, accessoires which is the bite fork and uh, some special bite fork support uh, which here is uh, uh, shown uh, with the impressions from the patient and here on the on the condylograph facebook and we also need a special mounting block with some geometrical imprints as you can see here and this goes into the articulator or into the uh, mounting stand okay and we can scan the relation of the bite fork to the mounting block okay so when uh, looking to uh, the articulation process we need three scans we need the regular intro scan of upper and lower and the relation of the upper and lower then we have an intra oral scan where we see the bite fork uh, together with the upper jaw and finally we need to see the bite fork together with the mounting block with the geometrical imprints the matching procedures are pretty simple can be done in exocut or in other software so we first match the upper jaw with the upper jaw and then we match the bite fork with the bite fork so this is the procedure of course the lower jaw is always then we are not touching it it all always comes with the uh, upper uh, upper jaw and if we test this method so we did for example here three trials okay we did one case in a laboratory scan scanner okay and we did three times tries okay and when we compared the three times kind there was always everything uh, within a limit of 0 0.5 millimeters which is uh, not precisely of course however when you remember in the guidelines hinge axis location should be something like better than two millimeters okay so this means that the 0 0.5 millimeters uh, somehow is uh, efficient or should be efficient enough okay so and uh, when we are looking to occlusal protocols occlusal protocol in the in the analog or digital gives you a, a sequence of contacts okay when a, a patient is biting always to the antagonist so this means when i have a contact on one tooth i can in the analog i would have a, a pinned model i can remove it and check for the next contact on the next tooth and so on so and if you see here the four trials so the the situation uh, are exactly actually the same and we don't see any differences uh, uh, through through this 0 0.5 different position of the mounting so uh, now let's go to the uh, topic uh, 9 and 10 this uh, should show you a little bit of the, the about our software we do have the gamma software with a cardiac analyzing uh, software and i like to switch now to the directly to the software okay so what we see here is a list of all the recordings of a patient and basically the software allows you is not a static picture it always gives you the dynamics okay so you can see here the dynamic drawing redrawing in excursion incursion we have the possibility to overlay all the tracings and we can go through uh, the tracings as we recorded for example here the media intrusion and we can retrace this you can click on any position okay and you can you keep get the results okay the time curves uh, gives the parameters, and this is maybe not a good choice. Uh, you go to protrusion. The time curves gives you uh, uh, the parameters like the coordinates or the velocity or the acceleration over the time. So this is the start of the recording. This is the end of the recording. This would be the now the excursion movement and now the incursion movement. This is very interesting, especially with timing phenomena clicking phenomena so things like this axis movement is clear so you see the hinge axis moving forward backward so you can judge very nicely the symmetry of the of the tracing then we have uh, the 3d animation 3d animation is a animated skull but we do have the the real movement okay uh, as an information uh, we also use uh, we also have a 3d software which we will uh, show you next week and here then you will see the real models uh, the re intro scans of the patient uh, moving together with the jaw tracking but this is an animation then we have the articulate articulator setting and uh, i would like to switch back here to my presentation 
because uh, I think this is now uh, another topic. Uh, yes, uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the recorded uh, uh, jaw information can be recalculated to the articulator as you can see here uh, for the reference articulator and depending on the uh, on the type of articulator the, card, the software will calculate for you uh, the sagittal condyle inclination if you have characteristics you can switch the characteristics of the fossa for an example or the characteristics of the transversal element and it also gives you setting for the incisal table if you want to have it the system uh, has been programmed for a total of 32 uh, articulator, different types. Also, uh, the DINAR and WIPMIX HANAO articulator types are included. And what are you getting uh, for the Mark uh, 330 as an example? So you see here the sagittal condyle inclination readings for the right side of the articulator, for the left side of the articulator and you see the values for, for 3, 5, and 10 millimeters. And the values you see here are to be immediately adjusted on the scale of the articulator, so you don't need any recalculation. On the transversal side, for the here for the 330, you have two things. This is the angle is what you maybe call is the progressive side shift angle, OK? So uh, this would be the setting for the progressive side shift, again, 3, 5, 10 millimeter. And then you also have immediate side shift settings if you have, would have immediate side shift in the recording. So what means 3, 5, and 10 millimeters? 3, millim 3 millimeters means that we calculate only the initial part in the best fit. Okay. So this means this is not a, just a value on 3. It's from 0 to 3. 5 means from 0 to 5, and 10 means from 0 to 10. So 5 includes 3, 10 includes 3 and 5. Okay? So when you ask me what would be the best value to set, always I think 5 millimeter is something like what you uh, are looking for. Okay, And this is now uh, coming to the end, showing you how to, to transfer information to ExoCut. Also, next week, we're going to explain you more in detail and also with, more, with live demo. This is just a short video. So with ExoCut, uh, we can have a simple uh, XML show motion export from the software. If you save that, then this is out. In the meantime, I want to inform you also that we are Gamma Company is a development partner of ExoCut. So we are also uh, able here in this video to show you how to load the data. So you go to the design uh, part of the ExoCut software. So this would be, for example, the splint design. Okay, And uh, then it loads. Okay, And here now you have can use this virtual articulator or load draw motion file and then we load the ones which we just have saved okay so these curves are saved and we use the reference position which we're done from the recording and here you for an example have the movements which we exported so we take the protrusion and the protrusion of the cardiac is here and can be used uh, exactly as uh, recorded and the same for the media intrusion and open close. Everything works analog to that. Okay, so you see here the media intrusion. Okay, I'm gonna quit that here now because I'm seeing that I'm getting too long with my presentation. Okay, I'm already coming to the finish. Okay, this is now the content of the next week seminar where we are getting more technical with. Uh, uh, digital mountain, semi uh, digital workflows with the with the gamma software, digital workflows with the uh, with the Cardiacs, uh, where we we'll talk about integration of CPC data, uh, virtual articulator and Cardiac dynamics, uh, uh, the the, the process, process of instrumental analysis in the 3D world, which is very important for us. 
then uh, graphic uh, numeric analysis of occlusion, CPM, the variation of positions, all in digital. So, and of course, again, Exocat uh, interface uh, and uh, more. Okay, I would like to end my presentation now and some special thanks to my my uh, co-workers, uh, Cynthia, Tassio, Thomas, and Dominic. Thanks. Uh, without your help, uh, my presentation wouldn't be as good as it is. And here is uh, some information if you like uh, to get about our products. Here is a QR code uh, to get you directly to gamma-dental.com. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you again to Witmix, to all the Witmix staff members making this possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. I really appreciate all the information you presented today. You hit on several topics that have been, uh, people have been thirsting for information. And I'm so excited about next week's seminar. And remember, it's at the same time next week, next Friday. And we'll be looking forward to seeing all of you. Uh, Whitmix does carry the Cadillac Compact 2 in the US. And you can touch base with us at our website under the sales department with Ravage Drizny and myself, Shirlene O'Russa, for an individual training on utilization of the Cadillacs. So please uh, enjoy and we'll see you next week.